so much for being here. I'm Dakota Dolan, uh, the president of the Eastern Writers Guild, and I'm so excited to be welcoming such a talented and accomplished poet here to our school. Uh, first, I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Carmen Sid, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, the Visiting Writers Series, and the English Department for helping provide the funding for this event. And, I, and also a special thanks to the wonderful English Department Secretary, Miranda Lau, for all the work she did in helping put this together. And finally, thank you very much to Dr. Daniel Donaghy for everything he did to make this day possible. But of course, mostly, I'm very excited to be welcoming our guest, Maria Meziati Gillen, <laughs> who so graciously agreed to come here today to lead a writing workshop and give this reading for us. Maria grew up in a low-income family in Patterson, New Jersey, the daughter of Italian immigrants. This formative part of her life is shown to us again and again throughout her work. The love she has for her family, for her heritage, for language, are all rooted in the circumstances of her upbringing, and the importance of this part of her life should not be understated. From here, Maria pursued an undergrad at Stenton Hall University in New Jersey and received her MA in Literature from NYU. Maria would go on to found and direct the, Poet the Poetry Center at Passaic <laughs> County Community College in her hometown of Patterson, New Jersey and created the Creative Writing Program at Bingham University, where she continues to work as a professor of poetry and director of the program that she created. She married Dennis Gillen, with whom she had two children, and is now the grandmother of two more. Maria's body of work is expansive and breathtaking, and she has received more praise and recognition than I care to list exhaustively. But to just touch on the breadth of her accomplishment, Maria has published 20 books over the course of her career and has been published in numerous journals and anthologies, including newsletters, the New York Times, Poetry Ireland, Connecticut Review, the Los Angeles Review, the Christian Science Monitor, Lips and Rattle, to name a few. She is also the co-author of four anthologies with her daughter, Jennifer. Last year, Maria received the 2014 uh, George Garrett Award for Outstanding Community Service in Literature from AWP. In 2011, she received the Barnes & Noble Writer, Writers for Writers Award from Poets and Writers, and she received the 2008 American Book Award for her book, All That Lies Between Us. In 2012, a documentary was made on Maria's life and, and work, which premiered at the Theater and Passaic County Community College in Patterson, New Jersey. Her two most recent books, The Girls in the Chartreuse Jackets and Writing Poetry to Save Your Life, the two which I have read, have been received with love and enthusiasm by critics and everyone else who I've met who has had the pleasure of reading them. The Girls in the Chartreuse Jackets is a bold step into the medium of visual arts, combining Maria's beautiful poetry with her fantastic watercolor paintings. To quote the Washington Independent Review of Books, these poems make up more than Maria Maziotti Gillen's rich mythology. Growing, growing up in Patterson, New Jersey with her Italian family, her initial wishes to be other than her pride in what she finds as her true self, poet, teacher, curator, now visual artist. The sense of self is found in the writing with a directness and passion, but made better by paintings, watercolors, and mixed media, conveying a biography more nuanced and delicate. In both, her keynote is honesty and simplicity that can only come from a seasoned artist. Writing poetry to save your life was also something new for Maria, a writing guide. I witnessed firsthand the impact it can have on a group of writers trying to improve themselves. To quote again from the Washington Independent, Independent Review of Books, Maria Gillen is the most no-nonsense poet and teacher writing today. She starts her book by saying, poems hide in a place inside of you that I call a cave. The cave is guarded by a crow that whispers in your ear in the voice of every authority figure that you've ever encountered. The crow tells you all the reasons why you can't write, shouldn't write. He tells you everything that's wrong with you. This is the heart and soul of the ensuing chapters, a veritable toolbox for creativity, and the mantra is courage, strength, truth. Gillen has practiced her trade with these merits, and she's taught thousands of students the difference between artifice and experience. The book is as much about self-creation as it is liberating the word, liberating the word in her crisp, direct advice, along with the full import of her sample poems, is verbal triumph. And of course, Professor Donaghy's own praise for her work could not be contained by merely having someone besides himself give this introduction. In his words, Maria <laughs> Messiati Gillen's contributions to American literature and the field of creative writing cannot be overstated. 
She has worked throughout her career to bear witness to her own experiences and to provide, provide platforms for others to do the same. Through her beautiful poems, her landmark anthologies, her writing guide book, Poems to Save Your Life, which I think is the best book ever written about what it takes to mine the raw material that goes into writing a strong first draft of a poem. Her years of dedicated teaching in the, in the creative writing program at Bingham University, which she helped to establish, and the Poetry Center at Passaic County Community College in her hometown of Patterson, New Jersey, which she also worked to establish, and where she has hosted many hundreds of literary readings and workshops. Maria has sought to help people claim the power of their voices and to speak without fear or filter or shame in their own words for as long as they'd like. How can you quantify the impact of a force like that? How can you measure the magnitude of the impact of someone who has done such important work for so long? Maria has certainly been a guiding voice in my career, and I am thrilled that Eastern students get to meet her today. And now it's those Eastern students who I want to talk about. So often it happens that when a group of students, even English majors, are given a book, that it is met with apathy, apprehension, or outright hostility. So often the discussion in a literature class, so often the discussion in a literature class simply dies when the professor stops pontificating because the essay isn't due for another week, so no one has bothered to hop on spark notes yet. This was simply not the case with Maria's work. For the first half of this semester, Maria's words filled our discussions every class as we read writing poetry to save your life. We would frequently and with great gusto praise Maria's work for the creative fire kindled in each of us. It pushed us not just to write, but to write about what matters to us without fear or reservation. Each page was a mini prep talk, pep talk, pushing us forward. The book spurred intellectual debate as well. I remember a brilliant conversation surrounding her chapter on the fear of what others will say about your work. We delved into what it means to be true to yourself in your writing and what changes, if anything, when you offer that work for publication. When I read The Girls in the Chartreuse Jackets, I admit that I was somewhat intimidated at first. I've never been a visual arts person, so when I'm told to confront that vast foreign medium, I often shut down and can't say anything more intelligent than that looks pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> but once I began to read and to look and absorb, I was taken by the authority and honesty with which Maria creates art, both literary and visual. When I looked at a painting or read a poem, her work demanded to be seen and heard and felt. Maria talks frequently in her work about how growing up in a space between languages and cultures made her appreciate just how powerful the ability to communicate is. It is with this understanding and the mastery of how we express ourselves to others that Maria is able to make her work so powerful and so accessible to anyone who might be fortunate enough to experience it. And now, please join me in welcoming to Eastern Maria Maziotti. Thank you, darling. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. I had to give him a hug. I'm an Italian. Uh, the dean was making fun of me because I talk with my hands. And I said, I think it's a mark of brilliance that I talk with my hands. If you don't like it, pfft, to you. Um, I'm going to start with a poem, and I really want to thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, when, I, when I wrote this book, um, Writing Poetry to Save Your Life, I, I really was trying to write a guide that would not teach you how to write a sonnet, you know, not teach you how to write a villanelle. I wanted it to give you courage, to give people permission to tell the stories they have to tell, and to believe that the stories they have they have to tell are important, that people need to hear them, that we need to discuss what it means to be human, what it means to love, what it means to feel like an outsider, what it means to lose. Um, grief and loss and death and love are all part of what it means to be human. And we all have that story to tell because we're all alive and we're all human and we need to be able to communicate with one another. If we shut down and are afraid, then I don't think anything can ever be done. The books I remember best are the ones that made me cry or made me laugh or made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I can still remember reading Carson McCullers, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, and it must be 50 years ago. And I can remember that scene in which she describes the little girl sitting under a window listening to classical music and just 
absorbing it through all the pores of her skin. And I read that passage and I really started crying. Then I cried the rest of the way through the book. I've never forgotten the book. And I think that what we aim for when we write is to have people remember what we've written, remember the characters we create, remember the stories we tell. Anyway, I'm going to write, read a poem called Growing Up Italian, but it could be actually growing up anything, okay? Uh, you can substitute anything you want for this. When I, when I was a little girl, I thought everyone was Italian, and that was good. We visited our aunts and uncles, and they visited us. The Italian language smooth and sweet in my mouth. In kindergarten, English words fell on me, thick and sharp as hail. I grew silent, the Italian word balanced on the edge of my tongue, and the English word lost during the first moment of every question. It did not take me long to learn that dark-skinned people were greasy and dirty. Poor children were even dirtier. To be dark-skinned and poor was to be dirtiest of all. Almost every day, Mr. Landgraf called Joey a spaghetti bender. I knew that was bad. I tried to hide by folding my hands neatly on my desk and being a good girl. Judy, one of the girls in my class, had honey blonde hair and blue eyes. All the boys liked her. Her parents and grandparents were born in America. <clears throat> they owned a local tavern. When Judy's mother went downtown, she brought back coloring books and candy. When my mother went downtown, she brought back one small brown bag with a towel or a sheet in it. The first day I wore my sister's hand-me-down coat, Isabel said, that coat looks familiar. Don't I recognize that coat? I looked at the ground. When the other children brought presents for the teacher at Christmas, embroidered silk handkerchiefs and evening in Paris perfume, I brought dishcloths made into a doll. I read all the magazines that told me why blondes have more fun described girls whose favorite color was blue. I hoped for a miracle that would turn my dark skin light, that would make me pale and blonde and beautiful. So I looked for a man with blonde hair and blue eyes who'd blend right in, who'd give me blonde, blue-eyed children who'd blend right in, and a name that would blend right in, and I'd be melted down to a shape and a color that would blend right in. Till one day, I guess I was 40 by then, I woke up cursing all those who taught me to hate my dark foreign self. And I said, here I am with my olive toned skin and my Italian parents and my old poverty real as a scar on my forehead. And all the toys we couldn't buy, all the words I didn't say, all the downcast eyes and folded hands and remarks I didn't make rise up in me and explode onto paper like firecrackers, like meteors. And I celebrate my Italian-American self rooted in this, my country, where soon all those black, brown, red, yellow, olive-skinned people will raise their voices and sing this new anthem. Here I am, and I'm strong, and my skin is warm in the sun, and my dark hair shines, and today I take back my name and wave it in their faces like a bright red flag. I'm going to read a poem about my mother. I, I know you can't even think of a $2 house dress, but I was young, very long time ago, and there were such things as $2 house dresses, honest, I, I promise. <laughs> and my, my mother wore them. I imagine my mother wearing a $2 house dress crisp with starch. She owned two or three of them. She washed them on the scrub board in the kitchen sink and hung them out to dry in the sun. Then she poured liquid starch into a basin, sprinkled it on the dress, heated the iron on the coal stove, and ironed the dresses to crispness. Sometimes I'd go to Meyer Brothers and look at the house dresses there. I knew my mother's dresses were much cheaper looking, the, flower, the flowers on them not as pretty, the material so coarse it scratched my skin. I think of the years of those inexpensive dresses and of the satin dress, 
red satin, rich and creamy, my mother bought for me to wear to the freshman Christmas dance. The red dress brightened my sallow face, the cut of the dress, the darts on the bodice, bodice the nipped in waist, set off my small high breast, my size 23 waist. Uh, the subtle roundness of slender hips. I loved the way it moved around me when I walked and how beautiful I felt in it. And now, with my mother five years dead, I realize I never thanked her for the stiff house dresses she wore for years, for the $25 dress for me she couldn't afford but bought anyway, for teaching me how to look at my children as she looked at me, her eyes saying, oh, you are beautiful in that dress and for that one moment when I believed her. And isn't that, after all, what we really want to give our children, that belief in themselves, that I always feel sorry I get, you know, because I teach creative writing, uh, students tell me things in, in their poems and in, when I meet with them that they probably wouldn't tell anybody else. And I always feel so sorry when I hear a, a student talking about a mother or a father who is unsupportive of them, who acts as though there's something wrong with them, who is always making negative comments to them. Not that my mother was Mrs. Uh, uh, kind in that way. She was really tough, actually and she wanted you to be absolutely the best you possibly could be. But some of these st students are, there's an Italian word, at least a dialect word, called spertuta. And it, in a way, it's as though these people, it means lost. And these people, because they have nobody, seem lost to me. There's nobody to, they can depend on. Nobody they know will always show up for them. And no matter how little money we had, I always knew my mother would be there for me, even if she was criticizing me for having the wrong haircut or whatever. Anyway, this is called When I Was a Young Woman. And I see there's a lot of young people, so I have to explain to you that when I was a young woman, there was such a thing as a rubber girdle. And a rubber girdle had tiny little holes in it, and it was literally made of rubber. And getting it on was an absolutely difficult acro acrobatic feat and getting it off was even harder. You had to put talcum powder on yourself so you could pull the damn thing on. Now, I was skinny. I had no behind at all. I always envied girls with behinds because I didn't have one. Now I got a big fat one, but not, not, the, not the kind that I would like to have. And, uh, uh, but that was so hard to get on and off. Anyway, when I was a young woman, I wore a white rubber girdle that only weighs 104 pounds and didn't have an ass, or at least I had a very flat one. But all the young women I knew wore girdles with snaps attached to hold up our nylon stockings. The girdle had little holes punched in it to let it breathe. Well, actually, it didn't breathe very well, and it was difficult to get off. Now, I wonder if that wasn't the idea. Underpants, white cotton, the girdle over them, the stockings, a slip, a skirt, all those clothes intended to protect our virginity, which of course they never did. <laughs> it was a little like my mother's idea that if I was home by 10 p.m., she had made sure I would remain pure. Or like the time, the third date I had with the man I would later marry, when we pulled up in front of the house in Dennis's old Plymouth and we sat talking, my back against the door, while we discussed philosophy because we thought we were great intellectuals. My mother rushed out of the house in her robe, her hair in pink foam curlers, a broom in her hand. She used the handle to bang on the window and yelled, my daughter does not sit in front of the house in a car. Get inside. Shy and awkward, Dennis leaped out of the car to open the door for me. He barely said goodbye before he jumped into his car to run away. Of course, he did come back, but I was so humiliated, I thought I'd never see him again. And of course, the rubber girdle and the early curfew and all the other efforts my mother made didn't work at all. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a poem called 90s. And one of the things I discovered, because I, we were poor when I was a kid, I just didn't, there was a lot that I didn't know about what upper class people had 
or what was the difference between something open by, owned by an upper class person and something owned by a poorer person. So I, I had no, I would look at movies and I'd see that Doris Day and uh, would wear these beautiful peignoir and, and I didn't realize how expensive that stuff was because I, there was that just, my mother, my mother's idea of a Christmas present was white cotton underpants and an undershirt. So when I got married, we had a bridal shower, they had a bridal shower for me and I got all these nylon nightgowns. At my bridal shower, someone gave me a pink see-through nightgown and pink satin slippers with slender heels and feathers. The gown had feathers on it too. I've always hated my legs, and even then when I was still thin and in good shape, I didn't want to wear that nightgown or slippers, didn't want to parade in front of you like some pinup. But I wore them all anyway, all those negligees I got as shower presents. Sleazy nylon I didn't know was tacky. In all the young years of our marriage, I wore a different nightgown every night. Not that it ever stayed on for long. Afterwards, I'd pull it back on, afraid our children would find me naked in our bed. I felt so sophisticated in those nightgowns, like the ones Doris Day wore in movies. Only years later, when my daughter buys me a nightgown made of soft and smooth blue silk, do I realize that the first ones I owned were cheap imitations of this, the one I hold now to my cheek. Grateful to have been once what I was. How lucky I am to have loved you in nylon, in silk, in my own incredible skin. And I'm going to read a poem, uh, which I read in the class today, but I'm going to read it again, um, called What I Can't Face About Someone I Love. And it's a poem, um, about my son, who is now has two um, now has two um, children who are one is in college and the other one has graduated from college, and um, uh, he's an arch conservative and I'm an arch liberal, so it really is very difficult to have a conversation. What I can't face about someone I love, that my son loves me but would prefer not to see me too much. Every Sunday night when I call him in North Carolina, where he lives with his wife and two children, I can hear the heaviness in his voice, his hello tempered with impatience, our conversation stiff and stilted. They always think I can talk to a stone. Strangers in buses and trains tell me their life histories. Acquaintances tell me about their affairs and shattered marriages, show me the secret undersides of their lives. My graduate students vie for my attention. They want, to, they want to sit next to me and carry my bags and fetch my lunch. But my son can't wait to get off the phone with me. I ask him how the kids are or specific questions about school, ask about his wife, his job. He answers with one or two words. They're fine or okay or the same. My son is a lawyer. He was always brilliant with language, at least written language, and he can read a 300-page book in an hour and remember every detail. But with me, he turns mute as a stump. If I ask for help with some legal problem, of course he will give it. But I do not hear in his voice the lilt I hear in my daughter's voice when I call her. Instead, I hear reluctance as though his attention were focused on some truly fascinating person and he can't wait to get off the phone. I tell stories that I hope will amuse him, but finally, after struggling and finding no response, I can't wait to hang up. I say, well, John, have a good week. Give everyone a hug for me. I know my son has divorced me, somewhere deep inside himself in a place he doesn't look at. I am too much for him, too loud, too dramatic, too frantic, too emotional. I laugh too much. I wear him out in a minute and a half. If he never saw me again, he wouldn't miss me. And this is what I can't face about someone I love. And I, I'm, I was on NPR recently and the man who was interviewing me said, um, I'd like you to read the 
poem, Little General, and I started to read it, and I suddenly realized that my brother used to call my mother the Little General, and I suddenly realized that my, both my brother and I are bossy and a little general too. But it was in the middle of this interview at NPR that I suddenly dawns on me, wait a minute, we used to call my mother that, but basically <laughs> we're no better. My brother called our mother the little general when we were teenagers, my brother driving the car, my mother sitting next to him, her head a small dark knob barely reaching the top of the seat. My bossy mother who told us how to live our lives. My mother who was always moving. When I remember her, I see her almost as a blur, like the cartoon of the Roadrunner. My mother who washed all the dishes as soon as the last bite of food vanished from the plate. My mother who held my doctor brother's foot until he fell asleep when he was still a boy. My mother who sat at the kitchen table with us, always ready to hear the stories of our lives, ready to tell the story of hers. My mother who told me everything that was wrong with me so I can still hear her voice, though she said she told me for my own good. My mother who loved the feel of the earth on her hands, who smelled of flour and spices, who baked thousands of loaves of bread and cooked innumerable fragrant meals for her children and grandchildren in her basement kitchen. My mother who taught me how to laugh. My mother who could not read or write, and though she wanted to go to school, my father wouldn't let her. Women don't need to go to school, he said. My mother, who did not know how much money my father had in the bank and never wrote a check. My mother, who wanted to learn how to do everything. My mother, who could quote poems she memorized in third grade in Italy before she had to leave school. My mother, who drew an imaginary line around us to keep us close. The front stoop, our boundary, the family, our country. A little sturdy body, better than any magic charm. My mother, whose skin turned orange before she died, though the week before she got sick, she planted a huge garden. We were sure she was too powerful to die. Ma, even now, 10 years after the funeral procession led us to Calvary Cemetery and to the mausoleum drawer they filed you in, I wish I could drive over to your house and find you there. Your earthy humor, your warm arms, that always were the place I call home. Um, I'm going to read a poem about my grandson, and it's called "The Boys." The boys call my grandson names. I carry my grandson's picture on my wallet now, as though by carrying him with me, I could make the boys in his junior high stop calling him names. In the picture, he has his arms folded across his chest, as though that would prevent people from noticing the weight he's gained. In the same way, I wear black, hoping that I will hide the obvious fact that I am no longer 104 pounds. His mother tells me that often, when she picks him up from his new school in Texas, he is crying. His best friend from North Carolina still calls him every week. They spend an hour on the phone together. I hear in his voice how happy he is when he talks, how words spill over themselves. When he hangs up, he goes up to his room and does not come out for an hour. I know that for the rest of his life, he will remember the names these boys call him, the names he's too ashamed to repeat to his mother and father, though they ask him, what is it, what is it, he refuses to say. I think of those wood-burning kits you can use to burn a name on a cabin or a door, and I know the names the people called him are burned in his memory in letters as thick and dark as any you could hang on a door. And he will carry those voices with him even when he is old and has lived his life. Where we all remember the first time other children pointed at us and laughed, and the loneliness of a junior high field where no one picks you for a team or calls you friend. Um, and I want to read a poem called In Japan, The Earthquake. Um, it strikes me that so many times when terrible things happen, we're totally unaware that they're going to happen. We, we just don't, we don't realize that they're going to happen and we go about our business and then something dreadful happens. As though there's a kind of eggshell egg thinness to the crust of the earth and when we're going to fall through, we never realize it. 
Anyway, in Japan, the earthquake. The TV news, newscaster shows scenes of Japan after the earthquake and tsunami. Flashing across the bottom of the screen, Japanese concerned about the meltdown of a second reactor. The Japanese evacuated the area for 12 miles around. The air is already contaminated. How easily we break, and once broken, how can we be repaired? My daughter, even eight years after her husband told her he met someone else and wanted a divorce, has not healed. She trusts no one, retreats to the safety of her condo. My daughter is still broken. I wish for her a daughter like the one she's been to me, but even I, the optimist of all optimists, no longer allow myself to believe. In Japan, the nuclear reactor melting, the air contaminated, they evacuate the area for 12 miles. It is already too late. They say they tested people, and though they test positive for radiation, they're not sick yet. I look at the picture in the newspaper of her grandmother with her grandson after the evacuation. She has her arms around him. He leans into her chest. Imagine all the people who will die from radiation, maybe not tomorrow or the next day, but soon. My daughter has been touched by the radiation of her husband's betrayal. She is only one person, and though she is mine, I know the world is full of destruction. The TV announcer says the same thing that happened in Japan could happen here, Indian Point, so close to huge centers of population. But we are Americans. We believe we are invulnerable. We believe we are safe. We are certain nothing like that can happen to us. That night, my daughter's husband told her, I have something to tell you, and you're not going to like it. But in the moments before his words hit her like bullets, she did not suspect. She cooked dinner, washed the dishes, hummed under her breath. She thought nothing bad could happen to her, the man she loved in the living room, she in the kitchen humming. The people in Japan, Japan were going about their lives while radiation seeped into the air around them and they breathed it in. I have so many books that it's really, really uh, getting kind of uh, embarrassing. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, I'm going to read a poem uh, called After My Reading in New York City. And I will say that when I read this poem to graduate students, uh, to my graduate students, one of my graduate students wrote me a poem back. And she said, Maria, there's, there's a, a poem. Well, I'll read the poem, then I'll, I'll tell the anecdote. Um, after my reading, a young woman in ja jeans and a lavender t-shirt approaches me. You insulted my profession, she says. What profession, I ask. I'm a prostitute, she says. I apologize to her and do a lot of backpedaling. You know, people think we're prostitutes because we like sex. We do it for money, she says. I apologize again, and then make it worse by saying, I think your profession might be dangerous. You are taking care of yourself, aren't you? And I pat her on the arm, turn myself into her grandmother. Oh, yes, she says, the old, older women tell us what to do. It isn't often that I can't think of anything to say, but at this moment, no more words come, not of apology or excuse or explanation. Like a car that is stalled, I sputter out another apology. When I am leaving, I wave at her, though she is looking at me as though she'd like to run me over. And I wonder what planet I come from that I think waving at her would be appropriate, just like I blow a kiss to my Hasidic student, even after he jumped away from me earlier in the day when I tried to hug him and he shouted, no, no, only my wife is allowed to touch me. My friend says, why is it whenever you get near him, you touch him, you, you touch his arm, you reach out toward him. He may have to go upstairs and take a shower when you do that. What little imp inside me made me blow him a kiss when he was presenting at an academic conference, and I can only hope he doesn't have to go upstairs and take a bath again. He'll end up being the cleanest man at the conference, thanks to me. He's actually a wonderful poet, too. His name is Yoshua November. Um, he's a, an amazing poet. If you get a chance to read his work, he, he's really a wonderful poet. Um, 
I'm going to read another poem kind of making fun of myself. Um, I have a lot of superstitious beliefs, which I try to get rid of the, the, the peasant in me, but I've never quite succeeded. And um, I, I think red protects me from the evil eye. So that's why I have 9,000 red jackets, red blouses, red, red everything except pants, because you know what, I don't want to show off in red pants. Uh, anyway, this is called What Protects Us. In the airport screening line, the officer says, what do you have on? Something shows up on the machine, and she points to my breast. I mumble and can't find the right words to explain. Can I say that I'm a university professor and a poet, and I'm still wearing an evil eye horn, a scapula, a red ribbon safely pinned to my bra that I've worn every day of my life for as long as I can remember? The Italian su superstition of the evil eye horn protects us from people who wish us harm. And the scapula is from my early days in the Catholic Church and my red ribbon that I've been told will protect me from malevolent forces in the universe. The officer is moving her hand over my body. I can't get the words out to explain. She says, here, let me see. And she pulls the neck of my shirt and looks inside my blouse. I am not ashamed to have her see my breast, but rather to have her spot the clump of red ribbon, the old scapula, the gold evil eye horn, and the safety pin that attaches them all to my bra. Oh, she says, and I know she thinks I'm wacky for believing these charms can protect me. As I believed in them when I was a little girl, my mother pinned them to my undershirt. And although I know it's stupid, I wear them anyway, every day moving them from a dirty bra to a clean one, never going out without them. I even have a, about 14 red jackets and scarves and bracelets and necklaces that color some part of me still believes will lead me safely through the perilous world and even past the officer who might think I'm crazy but waves me through anyway. And um, I'm going to read a poem called Sleepover. And, and some of you, for you, you're going to think this is insane, but I never, I never had a hamburger till I went to this girl's house when I was 19. I mean, my mother made, didn't make American food. She made Italian food. That's how she learned to cook. And so that's the kind of food we ate every day. Um, anyway, I went to my first sleepover. My mother was most he hesitant to allow me to go and sleep at anybody else's house. She thought we were only safe when we were in her house. Of course, we lived in a slum, so I don't know how safe we were. <laughs> but anyway, she thought she guarded over us and she was about four foot eight and that she could protect, protect us from anything. My first sleepover was at Betty's house in Little Falls, her family's stucco and timber house on his big property. I was 19. I met Betty the first day of college and she became my best friend. My mother finally agreed to let me sleep over at Betty's house, though my mother believed we were only safe when we were in our own house. Since she left Italy when she was 23, she never wanted to go anywhere again. Our house was her country, she the absolute monarch. But this time she said I could go, so I took the bus home from college with Betty and we had dinner with her family. We had hamburgers for the first time and no one spoke except to say, pass the potatoes, please. No laughter. No political arguments, her father stoic and silent, her mother expressionless, her face frozen, her brother eating and not looking at anyone. I was so nervous and uncomfortable I could hardly swallow. Later we sat together, Betty and I in her bedroom, and talked about school and boys and books and professors. When it was time to sleep, Betty pulled out the sofa bed in the living room and we climbed in. I felt uncomfortable. Every noise and creak in the house scared me but finally I slept. In the middle of the night, her huge black cat jumped onto my chest and I screamed, waking up the entire house. Her mother and father ran down from upstairs. Her brother appeared in the hall. I wanted to hide and I kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the next morning, I couldn't look any of them in the eye. At home again, eating the food I was used to, meatballs and gravy and macaroni and brujola. Sitting at our kitchen table, my family around me, talking politics and laughing. All of us part of a group we knew we belonged to. I was glad to have my mother hug me to her chest, where I could smell the aroma of vanilla and sugar and flour. 
And even today, I imagine I can call my mother back from the dead and breathe her in. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read a couple more poems. Um, I'd like to read a poem from the girls in the chartreuse jackets. And I do have to say about the girls in the chartreuse jackets that the publisher had to chase me for the, a year because I thought he was insane, that he wanted, because I can't draw. And I'm thinking, I can't draw. How in the world are you going to, how are you going to publish a book with my drawings? In? And, and the only reason I even started to draw was because Diane de Prima, the beat poet, uh, we were going on a reading tour, and we left San Francisco, and before we left San Francisco, she insisted I go to this art supply house, and that we were going to buy, uh, we were going to buy art supplies for me. And I tell you, my heart sank to my feet, and I'm thinking, I haven't painted since I was about 27. I'm way past 27 now. This woman uh, is a famous poet, uh, and I'm going to have to paint in front of her? Ugh, what a horrible thought. Well, anyway, we get to... Um, we get to Santa, we were going to Santa Cruz. And we get to Santa Cruz and she said, okay, you go in your room and I'll go in my room and I'll paint and you'll paint. And I get inside and um, I look out the window and there, there were beautiful roses in front of the window. So I spent all sorts of time trying to draw these roses and I couldn't do it. And I kept ripping up the paper and throwing it on the ground and then finally, I thought, wait a minute, what do you tell your students? Just let go. It doesn't have to be anybody else's flower. It doesn't have to be anybody else's rose. It can be your rose. And once I did that, it was so wonderfully free freeing. I am so grateful to Diane for, for that because it was such a blessing for me um, to, to be able to find another art form that seemed to me to be different from writing poetry, but also connected in some weird way. And I've had such a good time doing this. And I must say that I will never give it up. I might not be a great artist, but I do enjoy it. Anyway, I'm going to read in seventh grade. In seventh grade, I wanted desperately to buy a chartreuse sack and satin jacket that all the cool girls in the class had. I thought those jackets were beautiful, so shiny and soft, and that wild color that was so popular that year. My mother said, no, you don't need that junk. And looking back, I see how cheap and sleazy those jackets were, how the colors would have made my olive tone skin look jaundiced. But then I fell asleep, dreaming my mother bought me that jacket, and I'd slide my arm into the, arms into the sleeves, and miraculously, I would become one of the cool girls, the girls who stood around on Patterson Street corners with boys in black leather jackets, the girls who would be the first to be kissed, the first to go out on a date, the first to wear a boy's ring on a chain around their neck, and not someone like me, shy, inarticulate, introverted, and unable to find even one word to say to the boys in the class who treated me as though I were brilliant, breakable. Something in my big eyes and obvious innocence that made, me, that made them want to protect me. In seventh grade, I wanted to be sexy and to have that quality some girls had that drew boys to them like bees to honey. The musk my friend still has, where men flirt with her and where her whole body changes when she talks to them. So seventh grade is an old memory in black and white. Some part of that child remains, wanting a pill that could transform me, while the other part of me the one that races through my life like the road runner, the one who has long since left seven, seven street, that 17th Street tenement behind, knows I would not trade the woman I had become for all the shiny chartreuse jackets in the world. And I, I'm going to read... Um, uh, a poem about my husband. My husband got early onset Parkinson's disease, and um, he died five years ago. And I don't know if you know what early, it's what um, Michael J. Fox has. Um, it hits them when they're very young and when they're re relatively young, and it takes a long time to knock them off completely. Anyway, I, I want to read uh, a poem about Dennis and I when we were young going to the movies in Kansas City. I loved the smell of popcorn, 
the salt and butter taste of that hot popped corn. The barrel of it we carried into the theater where we grabbed handfuls from the cardboard container and crunch our way through Play It Again Sam or Annie Hall. You and I holding buttery hands in the darkened theater when we were still young, our children sleeping, the babysitter watching, and we off on our own to the movies. We went to the movies every week, crying through the pawnbroker and Midnight Cowboy, the theater still huge like when I was a child, maroon velvet draperies on the walls, cherubs carved into sconces, crystal chandeliers. The film's re recreating a world that for us had been torn apart by Vietnam, de bo dead bodies of young men unloaded in bags from planes, funerals at Arlington, mothers accepting folded flags in place of their children. We wanted the world to change, knew this was a war we didn't believe in. Though we were just old enough, you didn't have to go. After the movies, we, we merged into the Kansas City night, your arm around me as we walked to our car, where we talked about the movie and what it made us feel. We could not imagine what would happen to us or the world, though we thought we knew everything. And for me, that's the thing that I think um, so many of us don't realize that when, when we're young, we really do think we know everything. And it's a long time before we find out all the things that are waiting with their axes to get to knock us down. I'm gonna finish with a poem about my husband. My husband died right around the time of the BP oil spill. And when he was dying, his hands turned black at the tips. And if you saw those images of the dying birds um, after the oil spill, there was so much black um, oil spread on their wings and uh, on their beaks. And th it, those two things became very caught up in my mind together. And I think the thing that I found myself doing was grieving for what we've done to the world, which it's as though we're trying to ruin the world in some basic way. We're given something perfect and beautiful and and somehow or other we managed to ruin it. We managed to pollute it. We managed to take away its freshness. Watching the pelican die. On TV, I watched the pelican with its mouth wide open, its wings and body coated with oil. Is it screaming? I do not hear the sound. And since this is a photograph, I don't know if it was caught in that mouse stretched howl, howl when it died, or if it's howling in recognition that it cannot survive, the thick coat of oil that bears it down. The ladies who take care of you when I'm gone tell me you're having trouble. His hands, they say, his hands. When I come home, I see your hands have turned black at the tips and the ends of your fingers have been eaten away. I watch the dead bird in the gulf floating on top of the water, its legs stiff and straight in the air, its body drained of all motion, all light. The next day, I take you to the doctor. He tells us he'll have to operate to remove the gangrenous flesh. The announcer on CNN says, BP didn't want the photographer to take pictures of dying birds covered as they are with the black slick of oil. They're hoping, he says, the birds would sink and the evidence would be swallowed by the ocean. And late afternoon, I hear my daughter cry out. I rush to see what's happened, and you are stretched out on the bed. Your body's so thin, you look like a boy. You do not move. I call 911. The ambulance takes you to the hospital. BP is trying to put a cap on the spewing oil rig, the CEO keeps saying. It's no problem. Clumps of oil wash ashore and float on the surface of the water. The beach is littered with dead fish and birds. At the hospital, they want to know whether we want extraordinary measures. No, I say, he has a living will. We hover around while they admit you. You have forgotten how to speak. Mostly you lie in bed, staring into a space above our heads. I reach out to hold your hand, stroke your forehead. Dennis, I call out. Dennis, you do not hear. The neurologist comes in to see you. Well, he says, he should have been dead five years ago. What did you expect? You shouldn't have taken such good care of him. We did everything we could, the BP president says, looking directly at the camera. It's not such a calamity. We don't need to stop deep water drilling. We stand around your hospital bed. 
My brother comes in, says he'll try a stronger antibiotic. The social worker tells me, you should put him in a nursing home. My brother tells me, you kept him home all this time. If he gets a little stronger, I'll let him go home and he'll be around the things he knows. Another doctor comes in and says, he's not going to make it. The social worker admonishes us with her bag of common sense. She does not love you. We take you home. I sit next to you and hold your hand. The reporter stands on the beach in a hurricane and picks up a huge glob of oil with a stick. Look, she says, look, and drips the oil on the white sand. Dead birds float by behind her. Althea feeds you a jar of baby applesauce. You open your mouth and accept the food. When I see the pelican on TV with his mouth wide open in horror, I remember you as you lay dying. On the gulf, the earth and the sea are being destroyed, just as you were by this disease that finally defeated you after you struggled against it all those years. Some things are bigger than all of us. We cannot defeat them. If there is enough carelessness and greed in the world, even the ocean can be destroyed. And you who fought against this illness with such courage, even you cannot survive the blackened tips of your fingers, the oil heavy on the bird's feathers, the birds dead and floating on the surface that gradually sink and disappear.